Hey guys, so happy you're checking out this video. Uh, I'm Tyler Harrison, the, the middle school youth leader here at Life Church. Uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about what we do here at Life Church. On Sunday mornings at 10:15, the middle school meets uh, right behind me in another room, and uh, we get together and we we pipe the video in and we we watch the exact same video you're about to watch, and we just have time to fellowship and come together and, and learn about God. Uh, with that being said, I just want to thank you for, for checking the video out and enjoy. All right, good morning. So uh, a few announcements that we want to go through uh, here before we get started in the message today. So one, uh, pertaining to the youth camp uh, that the kids just got back from. Uh, so I want to give you a little bit of an update. So I asked Tyler, I said, so can you give me a synopsis of uh, how the youth camp went? And he said, well, God really moved in amazing ways. So I said, well, can I give me a, a story or what happened, you know, so to help us all see the ways that, that God can still move? Because I think for all of us at times, you know, through life, we wonder, like, is God still working? Is he still changing lives? Is he alive and, and well today? And so he talked about a, a story of a young man. So in the beginning of um, the, the camp, they told each one of the kids that uh, there's somebody out there that you know uh, who doesn't know Jesus. So take an opportunity, sit and think about that. Once you get that person in your mind, I want everybody to stand, right? The, once you finally get that person in your mind. So the kids would stand up. They had the person in their mind. And then they said, you know, as you go throughout this week and as you go home and coming up, because we all know when you go to camp, it's a huge high, but you got to figure out how to keep it going uh, throughout all of your life. And so they said, in this week, pray about how could you help meet the needs or a need for that person, right? So pray about that the entire week. Um, and so at the end of the week, one of the students came up to Tyler and said, listen, I just got a text from the person that I haven't taught, this person that was in my mind, haven't talked to him in months, but this person reached out and texted me and said, hey, I need some help. Can you help me meet a need? Right? And so this person texts back and, and uh, they started this conversation and now they're going to continue on with this conversation and uh, allow God to work. But what, what's amazing about that is that we always say, you know, hey, take a step, think about people, but it's always a hard thing to think about, isn't it? Like, haven't talked to this person in months. What am I going to say to him? What's the conversation going to be? Amazing how God works on the front end of it, right? Like he had not had a conversation with this, but God was already working and doing amazing things. So we could be praying for the students that were on this trip, um, that they continue on with the excitement for God that they had. Because if you've been on a camp trip before, you know that it's a huge high and you're excited and Great things are happening, but you can continue that on. And for those who didn't go on the trip, that they can catch the contagiousness of uh, the energy that comes from the kids that were on it as they go into uh, their ministry year. So that's how you can be uh, praying for them. The other is Champs Academy. So we talked to you guys last week about uh, Champs Academy uh, held a powerlifting event. And we needed a bunch of volunteers uh, to be able to help with it because the idea was if we get volunteers from the church, then we can keep the door fee, right? And if we keep the door fee, the idea is that the, the more money that we can keep, the more money we can give away. And so anyway, uh, the results of that, so uh, we were able to take $600 and give it away. So $300 went to uh, Pathfinder Services Creative Abilities, who's here uh, at Life Church, and $300 went to the Humane Shelter. So thanks to everybody who volunteered, because uh, that gave us the opportunity to keep the door fees and be able to give away the, uh, the, way the money, uh, which is, again, the vision of Champs Academy, right? to be able to create relationships, be able to make money, to be able to give away money. So thank you for all of you guys that supported that. The other one is uh, Kids Stuff 252. So it's uh, our children's ministry downstairs. The older kids are having uh, a picnic today. So uh, if you didn't know about it and you have kids that want to be involved, uh, you can get involved in that after church. And the last thing is our connecting events. We've talked to you guys about this before. We have three services. A lot of times you have no idea who goes to the other two services and how you can get to know people. Uh, and so once a month we have a connecting event that you can uh, get to know people. And it's during the 11 o'clock service, right, that people can... 11.30, is that when our service is? <laughs> All kinds of run days together for me. So during the 1130 service, you can come and uh, get to know some people uh, and that are coming to Life Church that maybe you've never met before. So, all right, good stuff going on. All right, so we are having just a, a single seer, a single message here today. Um, and part of the reason is, is because we want to talk to you about 
uh, the history of Life Church and kind of the vision that goes into it, and how each one of us can kind of participate in what that vision is and how we need to be able uh, to move that forward. And it gives me an opportunity to tell you for people that are new a little bit about my story and how God uh, has used me and this church and uh, the people that are in this community to to, to do uh, things and to be a part of it. And it's always awesome to be able to see how God can use ordinary people uh, to be able to do things uh, in this community. So we're going to talk about that and then hopefully be able to apply how can we move forward as a church and what do we need to do and, and how can we do uh, great things. So one of the challenges for me was I got saved later on in my life and I didn't really grow up in a, uh, a home that uh, talked about, like we went to church, but we never really talked about doing ministry. Like, how do you go out and reach people? And you just attend church, and then when you're done attending church, then you go home. Like, there was nothing else you did. So when I got saved later on, there was this uh, thing inside of me that said, well, I, you know, you need to do more. Like, it's not just good enough to be saved. Because I thought that was the first thing. Like, don't go to hell, so go to heaven, and so make a decision for Jesus. So that was the, the thing that came to, to mind for me. But after I gave my life to Christ, it was like, you got to do more than just exist on this earth waiting for heaven to come. I'm like, oh, well, how does that work? Like, I'm 21 years old, married, and a mechanic. Like, how does, like, how do you do things that are bigger in this world when you're just an ordinary person? Because I read books about people that have made a difference, and they've all went to school, right? And they all have a degree and, you know, or they grew up in this home where their whole family did ministry for all their life and they're just following in their father's footsteps. And I'm like, I don't have anybody to follow in the footsteps and my life's kind of already set. Like I've been praying about this, you know, say praying about it. I guess it's more like hoping that this would happen my entire life. I was going to marry Sherry. Uh, I was going to buy land in Adams County so that my kids could go to Adams Central because that was the best school that they could go to. My kids were going to grow up beside my, you know, uh, in-laws. Um, we're going to build a house someday. So all of that stuff's coming to fruition. We bought, I married Sherry, obviously. Uh, we bought 12 acres. We lived in a trailer. The idea was to build. We'd all got it ready. Sherry's parents had built around the corner. And so now I'm here like, okay, now you need to do bigger things in life. How do you do that? And I don't know if any of you guys are in the same dilemma that, that I was, and maybe you're in that today, is, is that I knew God wanted me to do more, but I don't know how to do it, right? And I, and I was pretty sure uh, that God uh, can't use normal, ordinary people to do incredible things, even though people said that all the time, right? Like, God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. I'm like, we'll put that puzzle together because I'm not sure how uh, that works. So we started taking the kids to uh, mission trips in Guatemala. So I became a part-time youth pastor because that fit, right? So I could still be a mechanic. I could still live at home, live in Adams County. Um, and I could do the God thing, right? Like I could work with kids. And so that satisfied part of those needs. Well, anyway, we take these mission trips to Guatemala, hoping that kids would catch on that, you know, don't be such selfish brats because you really have an incredible life compared to what people around the world have. And so we would take them on those trips, hoping that they would realize that, you know, they, they, there's more to life than just what you think. But on these mission trips, I would talk to this guy named Greg Miller. You've heard me refer to him before. And I would tell him, like, I think this yearning that God wants me to do more. And he would always say, like, well, why don't you just do more? That's what I did. And so he told me his story. So when he was 20 years old, he got saved. He wasn't married. He didn't know Spanish. He just decided to move to Zacapa, Guatemala, not knowing Spanish, and to be a missionary over there and learned it all his way and married his wife over there. I'm like, well, that's, I mean, that seems a little easier. Like, you didn't have anything tying you to the States, and you could just go whatever you do, and it didn't make any sense to me. So he said, I want you to read uh, the story of Nehemiah, right? And like, if you've read Scripture, you've probably heard of the story before. And he gave me, or told me about a book, two of them. One was Visioneering by Andy Stanley. Um, and in this book, it's essentially the story of Nehemiah and the idea how an ordinary person can do extraordinary things. Uh, so he said, go home and read it, but don't read it without reading uh, From Jerusalem to Irwin Jawa, which is the story of missionaries, American missionaries that did mission work all over the world. Because he says, if you're going to do extraordinary things, it is going to cost you something, right? Like this is the story of people who decided to do more than just exist in life. 
uh, and when they decided to do more, it actually is going to cost you something. And then later on, I was, I was uh, reading books because I love to read. I read The Hole in the Gospel. I don't know if anybody's ever read this before. Uh, but here's a guy that, like, he owned a, or he ran a China company. I can't actually remember what it was called. Fine China. Made tons of money. And then realized as he was reading Scripture that there was this hole in the Gospel, like, get people saved, but what about taking care of the needs of people? Like, how does that work? And how do you make all those things work? So inside of me, I kept seeing, oh, maybe there are stories where God can use that. So my hope is we're going to look at the story of Nehemiah today. And by looking at the story of Nehemiah, my hope is, because I think whether you've buried it or not, inside of every person is a desire who's been saved by Jesus Christ to have an impact on this world. Not just to exist, not just to get through, not just to get to the end of your life and go to heaven someday, but that you can have a significant impact. When I say significant impact, here's what we mean, right? When you're dead and gone, what difference will your life make, right? Like what legacy are you going to leave that once you've moved on from this world that you have done something that will last forever and ever and ever? So what are those things? Because that's what God has called us to do. So if you have a Bible, I want you to turn to Nehemiah. So this is going to be... Uh, Nehemiah, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 11, uh, and then also into uh, verse or chapter 2 a little bit. So the story of Nehemiah, ordinary guy, right? So he was a cupbearer for the king. And I don't know that it gets much more ordinary than that, but all the guy did was is drink and eat food before the king did to make sure he wasn't going to get poisoned, right? So he would go up, they would before the king would get a meal, he would taste it, he would drink the wine, and he would make sure that the guy wasn't going to get poisoned. Um, and so that's what he did day after day after day as he was a cupbearer. Now, for the king, that was a pretty important job, right? For Nehemiah, who was a Jew doing it for a Babylonian king, eh, right? Like, I don't know that this is going to be the story that they're going to tell at my funeral. Well, the greatest thing that Nehemiah did was, and he drank wine about every day, right? And he saved the Babylonian king, which nobody likes, from being poisoned uh, in his life. And so inside of him, I'm sure like all of us, was stirring something that like I need to be able to do something bigger. And so in his life, there is these moments. And I think we all have these moments. And inside of that, moments where something changes you, like you hear a story or, or something comes inside of you that changes your perspective on life. And it moves you to a point where you're saying, wow, I should probably do something about that. And when I read the story of Nehemiah, that story has been the guiding principle for the the things that God has done for me. So when stories come into my heart and I look at it and say, I don't know if you could really do this, like the idea that um, I was going to be a church planner, right? Not just a youth pastor. So you're going to go and plan a church. So how does a mechanic that works at Zerker Tires, who's never, Zerker Tires, never been to school, like how do you plan a church? Like, you've never planted anything, right? You've never started. Like, how does that work? And okay, and then I look at the book, the, the story of Nehemiah. And so then, uh, how do you not only start a church, which we thought that would be easier because we'd started in a community where we knew everybody, so we are going to do it in Adams County. So, hey, we can start it, and we know everybody because it's a small town, to, oh, you're going to plan a church, but it's going to be in Huntington where you don't know anybody, um, and that you're going to have to sell everything you have. And so the, the, the story of, well, it probably is going to cost me something. Like if I really want to follow God, it's going to cost me something to be able to do it. To the Cafe of Hope. So when we came here, we said, we don't think people are just coming to church anymore. Like we don't think that somebody's out on the street and they're just like, oh, wow, I should probably wander into a, a church today. We thought, you know, 30 years ago, that might have been the way it was. So we thought, well, the church needs to start something as a business, to be able to make touch points with people with the hope of sharing Jesus to them. Okay, you've never started a cafe, like the church, never, you don't really have that many business models to look at. And if you look at the business models, if anybody studied the business models of cafe, the only people that really make money is Starbucks, right? Like the real, I mean, it's serious. It's really hard to make money in a cafe and you're going to be a church and how's that all going to work? Well, again, so can God use ordinary people that have a bigger vision for, for reaching the world to make that work. Like, how does that... The same thing for Champs. Right? When we went to look at starting Champs Academy, we used to have a factory out back. I don't know if any of you guys were here uh, when we had the factory. So there's a factory out there and we're trying to think, like, this doesn't really work on, on vision of what we're trying to do. So what do you do with this, you know, 25,000 square feet? And so we talked about the ideas of a gym and everybody's like, a what? So have you studied the business models of gyms? 
like they don't make much money unless they're funded by somebody else, right? Like they, they're hard to be able to keep going. And really, like we've, nobody's ever started a gym and how's it all going to work? Same thing. So Nehemiah's story helped us guide us in saying, okay, God can do amazing things and use you in amazing ways if you live in his will, right? And if you're called by what he wants you to do. And so that's why I say these stories, this story has been a guiding principle as we move forward. So in Nehemiah, uh, uh, starting in verse one, so here's the story that changed uh, Nehemiah's life. So he says, then the words of Nehemiah, son of Helichi, the mo- in the month of Kislev in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived exile are back in the province and are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. So the story, 140 years ago, nation of Israel plundered by Babylonian people, burned the city, broke down the wall, destroyed them, took all of the Jews, put them into uh, the Babylonian culture and kept them away from all that. Now, in the midst of that, in that captivity, people had then gone back, right? So the Jews had said, we're going to get out of uh, the Babylonian empire. We're going to go back to uh, our home city. And so they get back to their home city. And so this is what Hananiah is telling Nehemiah. They're back in the home city, but we got a huge problem. No leader, no wall, no protection, and no idea what to do. Right? So a huge problem for the Jewish people. And so Nehemiah, this is what starts the story right? in Nehemiah's life. He heard from somebody else a great need. That's how it all starts. In every person's life, this is how it starts. Somebody tells you about, you read about, or you see a need. Now, the, the outcome of that is, what do you choose to do with it? Right? The outcome of whether or not you have a good work in your life or whether or not you make a significant difference is what do you do with the story? Like, what do you do with the information that you just got? So that's what we're going to look at. So three different ways in the story of Nehemiah where we can put together how you can look at information that you get and decide whether or not it's something that you should act upon or do to make a good work or to do a good work in your life. So the first one is this that you need to do is that you need to sit down and cry. Okay, so you hear the news, you need to sit down and cry. Now, here's what happened in the case of Nehemiah. He says, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God in heaven. Now, I'm just going to give you my own take on this is that, um, so I'm the type of person, like I tell my kids all the time, like, don't, I'm not watching a sad movie. Like the world's already sad enough. Like I don't really want to see it. Because, like, the emotion of it all, like, puts something inside of me, like, I want to do something about it. Like, there's this natural part of me that wants to fix problems, and I'm like, I already see enough sadness in the world, I don't really want to watch a sad movie. So my natural tendency is to keep myself away from the things that are painful, right? Like, I don't want to hear the stories, you know, if I don't hear them, I don't think about them, then I don't really have to to process what to do with them, because I know that when I start looking at them, if I allow them to become a part of me, do you know what I mean? Like if you, if you allow them to be a part, not just in your head, like it's not just a story that you read, but then it becomes a part of your heart, then there's this something inside of you that says, I'm probably going to have to do something about it, right? So a long time ago, I said, well, I'm going to have to start putting stuff in my life to make it so I can't ignore it. So I get these emails from the Voice of Martyrs, like one of the things that I always you know, would ignore that you know that there are people today that are going to church, they're being killed, right? Like they're being walked outside of their church. Like you had a hard time deciding whether you were coming, right? They're all not having a hard time deciding when to come. They're just having a hard time knowing whether they'll make it out, right? Like they're knowing that today could be their last day in the midst of that. And so I had to do that because inside of me, I got to figure out because the natural tendency is to push away the pain, right? So the natural tendency is you see an article, right? Like you don't want to know the statistics of how many kids are molested in Huntington right now, right? Like you don't want to know that, right? Like don't tell me, don't tell me, don't tell me, right? Or you don't want to know about the number of kids that are orphaned. Like I used to have people tell me this, like I talked about it a lot, or how many kids are sold into sexual slavery, 
Right? Like, you don't want to hear that. In fact, we would have people that would come up after certain messages where I would give statistics, and they're like, do you really have to tell us that? Like, do you really have to tell us that there's X amount of kids that are up for adoption and nobody's adopted? And do you really have to tell us that there's X amount of kids that are being sold into sexual slavery? Do you really have to tell us there's X amount of kids that are being sexually abused? Like, can't you tell us some good news? And I'm like, listen, at the end of the day, I think we should not insulate ourselves from the pain of the world. Right? Like, we're Christians. We shouldn't insulate ourselves from the pain of the world. I think what we should do is figure out how to internalize the pain. Right, like put yourself in that position. If it was your kid, like I told the story one time, like all these kids, and it's coming in the United States right now, like it happened overseas a lot where, where girls are abducted, you know what I mean? And they're taken and sold into sexual slavery. And we worked with a, a place that would go into the red light districts and rescue these kids and, and put them into places and rehabilitate them. And I said, think about this for a second. Like that's out there and we're doing it. And I felt terrible. But then I came home and I thought about what if somebody took Lexi? Right? Like, what if somebody showed up and took your daughter? Would you just sit back and be like, boy, that's a bummer, the plight of the world. Right? If somebody took your daughter, guys, what are you doing tomorrow? What are you doing today? You're going out and finding her at all costs. Right? Why? Because it's your problem now. You see, a lot of the pain in the world is somebody else's problem. We just leave it that way. Right? And one, I'm not being, saying this in a bad way. Part of it is, like, what do you do? You know what I mean? Like, part of the problem is, I have no idea how to stop sex slavery. I have no idea how to fix, you know, people that are, 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 are being molested. I have no idea how to fix the orphan problem in the world. So I have no idea where to go. But just so you know, in this story of Nehemiah, we can't use that as an excuse, right? The first thing that you have to do is internalize it to a point where it moves you to the next point. Does that make sense? Like you have to get to the place where you allow it to come in. Stop putting up the barriers like me, right? And saying, I'm not, I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to know about it. It's somebody else's problem. It's somebody, it's far off. It's overseas. It's not around me. I don't want to hear about it. You need to open yourself up to the same pain that God feels when he sees the world in the state that it's in. Now, you're not going to see it all, but I do think he'll show you things that he wants you to act on. Does that make sense? Like, I think that, that he's a God who will show you things and reveal things to you that will internalize things that you need to be a part of changing. So we, as, as Christian people, need to be able to internalize that and think about that. So now, as you're processing it, write this in your notes, do this. Ask yourself this question this week. What breaks your heart? You ever think about that? Like, throughout this week, sit down and take an opportunity, because I'll be honest with you, there are weeks that nothing breaks my heart because I'm too busy. Anybody else? Like the week goes on and, you know, I got work to do. I got kids to run around. I got stuff like, you know, like the only thing that might break my heart is not getting enough sleep. You know, it's like I don't really think about it because I get busy in life. I don't allow myself to sit at a place where I can see and, and allow things to come in that would break my heart. So I'd ask you this week, take some time, sit back, ask yourself this question, what breaks your heart? Now, for me, this is what I had to realize. If it's nothing, it's because I'm not looking. Because there's a lot out there, and you don't have to go overseas to see it. Amen? Like, you don't have to go overseas to see the hurt in the world. Take a look around talk to some people. There's some probably right next to you at work. There's probably stories of people that are involved in your life right now. People are hurting. So how do we do that? The next thing we need to do this is kneel and pray because that should be the next natural effect, right? You're hurting, like there's something that's being internalized, but if it's, if it's the right thing, then you're not going to know what to do with it, right? Like you're going to have no idea what to be able to do with these things. So kneel and pray. That was the next thing that Nehemiah did. He says this, then I said, Lord, the God of heaven and the great awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. Right? So he's praying for the thing that's on his heart. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We've acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you've given, you gave your servant Moses. 
Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even your exiled people are not at the farthest horizon. I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you, uh, whom you redeemed by the great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attended to the prayer of your servant, and let the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was the cupbearer of the king. So he started with this, and I think this should be our natural thing. If God puts something on your heart, Right, like just like sexual slavery, orphan kids, widows, whatever those things are, most of us don't have any idea how to fix that problem. Like if you look at the scope of it, you know what I mean? Like if you look at the scope of what the problem really is, you have no idea how to fix it, which is where you should be, right? Like that's where you should end up because the way that God's formula works in you making a great difference in the world is it's not you. Does that make sense? It's so like a lot of us be like, what abilities do I have and how can I do? And, and then you take God out of the scenario, right? Like I got, I'm really good at this and I'm really good at that and I could do this. And so then we try to figure out how to manipulate it on our own. But he says, Nehemiah makes us recognize the success and difference in your life starts with God and then plus you. Does that make sense? You know, it's God and his power is what's going to change the orphan crisis, Right? It's God and his power who could eradicate sexual slavery. It's God and his power. Now, does he need people to act? Yes. Does he need people to be a part of it? Yes. That's where we come into the picture. But what really changes the scope of the world? What really changes the orphan crisis? God. Only his power through the Holy Spirit can change the world. You know what's cool about that, though? We get to get used to do it. I mean, is there anything better than being used by God to change the world, but knowing it's not you? Like one of the things I landed on a long time ago is nothing is dependent upon me. I'm only supposed to be obedient. Like when I thought of the whole idea of how do you plan a church, when I finally came to the idea that I'm not planning the church, I'm just doing what God's asked me to do. And at the end of the day, if the church succeeds or fails, it's not really on me. I'm just going to do that. I'm going to wake up every single day and do what he asked me to do. And then if he doesn't want it to be here, then it doesn't have to be here. Right? Like it's whatever he wants it to be, it's going to be. I'm just going to be obedient through that. And that's, that's a great place to be, to be used by God. But we have to get to the place where the natural reaction of pain in your life moves you to the place of now I need to pray, right? And I need to figure out what God uh, wants me to be able to do. Because here's what, one of the things that I think we should be praying about and thinking about. One, did you see how he confessed his sin? Do you think that's interesting, like through the prayer? Because part of the confession that he did in the middle of us was to say, we do serve a God that's faithful. Like we made a mistake. Because that was the other part. Like, how does God use a loser like me? Because in all of my past failings, you know, and even when we started the church, I'm like, I guarantee you, he's like, he's not going to honor this because I messed this up and I messed this up and this person left because they were mad at me and I didn't say the right thing to this person and somebody came up after church and said they're leaving the church because I didn't give them everything that they needed. And I'm like, oh my gosh. You know, and at the end of the day, I'm like, I just have to say, you know what, God, I'm sorry. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm trying to do the best I can, but at the end of the day, I know you're faithful. Right? I know you're faithful. I know that you... If you want this place to succeed, if you want it to happen, it's going to happen. So I'm just going to keep being a servant, right? I'm going to keep failing, but I'm, I'm glad that that, that failing is just me and, and that a faithful God is going to stay with me. And so should you, right? Through all of your, you, you know, our shortcomings and all the things that we've done around, a faithful God is going to stay with you. And then he, for all of us, I think we need to pray for the courage to move out of what's comfortable, like that's, that's really this tipping point for a lot of people when it comes to living a life of significance. It's hard to figure out how to get out of the life of comfort, right? Like that takes courage to move out of something that's different. And it doesn't mean that you need to move to Africa. It doesn't mean that you need to go plant a church. But most significant things that you do in life will cost you something. And it's just not financial. It's comfort in your life. Like, you're going to have to do something that's going to be outside of your comfort zone and be different than what you do. So we need to pray for those things. Now, I wrote this down because this was something that I write in my journal all the time. What you pray about reflects what you believe about God. 
What you pray about reflects what you believe about God. So, and I, for me, this would happen all the time. So if my prayers were, thank you, God, for my food. Thank you for the wonderful day. And, and Lord, uh, bless me today as, well as I go out through the day and help me have a good day. Now, <laughs> you're going to kind of see my, like, how does he even bless food anyway? You know what I mean? Like, is it makes more protein or less fat, and I don't, when I eat it, it, it's like digest better, or like, and what does it even really mean to have a good day? Like, does it mean that I get to have everything that I want? So there are times my prayers reflect that I believe in a God that I don't need. Like, I don't need God to bless my food, right? Like, I get the intent if you say bless the food, so don't get me wrong if you're saying that. And I know that, you know, help me have a good day. But at the end of the day, if God didn't interact and everything went good for you and you had a good day, did you really need God? Did you really need God to bless your food and the things that go with it? Compared to if we pray about things that we need God to interact on, like we need God's help in, then we will pray for things that are way outside of our reach because we believe in a God that makes it possible to reach things outside of our reach. Amen? Right? Like you, what you pray about reflects what you believe on the inside. If you believe on the inside that God can eradicate, you know, orphans in the world, you're going to pray for orphans in the world, right? Because you believe God's going to interact and he's going to do and he's going to change. So we, what we pray about reflects uh, what we believe. And uh, remember that like inside of this, if you look at Nehemiah throughout all of the, the story, Nehemiah was a great leader. But the thing that you see is there's 12 more prayers after this. Every leadership he dis- decision he made was bathed in prayer. Like, I need to understand from God, it's just not my leadership capability. It's not just what I can do. It's God, what do you want me to do? God, what do you want me to do? Now, as a good natural leader, I could execute some of the things that you've asked me to do. Instead of the other way around, if you're a good natural charismatic leader or you're good at some of the things you do, you could just do it without even asking God, right? You could move forward in that. But he kneeled and prayed because he thought that it uh, was important. The next one, or the last one is this, stand up and act, right? So... If your tears, right, or not if, this is the way it should be, your tears should lead you to pray and your prayers should lead you to action, right? Like that's the way it should work. Something internalized in your heart moves you to the place where you pray about it and what you pray about, you're praying, hoping, not hoping, you're expecting a God who is faithful to answer you. God, what do you want me to do to fix the problem? Because I have a hard time believing That if you see a problem and God puts it on your heart, it'd be like, I don't need you to fix that. Right? Like, I don't, if you're praying about it because he's internalized it, he's going to give you the opportunity to meet the need. Right? But he's going to need you to stand up and act. In fact, in Nehemiah 2, 4 through 5, here's what he says The king said to me, What is it that you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king, If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him, let, him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. I mean, imagine that. I mean, here's Nehemiah, a cupbearer, is going to take on the idea of rebuilding a city. Like, he's not an architect, so he can't build a wall. He's never really led a group of people. So here's all these exiled people. They're probably better equipped leaders, right, to be able to do it. But at the end of the day, what Nehemiah had above everything else, he had a heart for it. He had a connection with God, and he had the ability or the the wherewithal or the courage to act. See, lots of people see sad stories. Lots of people say prayers. Few people act. Few people move into the place where the prayer is going to move you into some sort of action. So as the band comes back up, I want to give you a couple things to think about. Okay, so we're going to have the opportunity to do communion today, which I think fits really, really well, because imagine this. So Jesus Christ's death on a cross was so that you could do great things in this world, right? Jesus Christ leaving this earth, because here's, here's what you need to think about. People would ask me, don't you wish Jesus was here? We could do so many, you know, great things. And do you think the world would change because Jesus would interact with the people on the earth like he did with the disciples? I'm like, no, I'm glad that Jesus Christ died on a cross and rose again for two reasons. One, so that I could be forgiven and that I could be used because I can't be used without being forgiven, right? I, I, I had to first get right with 
Jesus Christ died on the cross for me, so I needed to get that right in my life. And then, this is what he says, and when I leave this world, I'm going to leave you with something. I'm going to leave you with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, now think about this, what he said. The Holy Spirit living inside of you will essentially give you the ability to do greater things than when I was on this earth. Now, I don't know if you've read the Bible (laughs) and the things that Jesus did and the disciples did on this earth. I don't know about you, but they're pretty amazing, right? Like if you read what happened while the... And he says to every single person in this room, you, doesn't matter your age, doesn't matter where you are in life, doesn't matter your education level, doesn't matter your financial, you know, exist, doesn't matter any of those things. You will do greater things in this world now. The question is, do you want to? Right? Like that's the the real question for all of us is this. Do you really want to do greater things? And if you do, you got to stop insulating yourself from the pain of this world. you got to come to a place where you allow the pain that God wants to, because it's not all the pain, just so we know. We're not asking you to be open up to it all, but I do believe that God puts special things on your heart because he knows you. And he's going to allow you to see things that are going to make that different. Internalize the pain. Pray to the one who can change it. And act and make a difference in this world. So as we take communion, this is what I'd ask you to do. Remember, your life was bought at a price. Are you willing to live worthy of the cost? Are you willing to be used to help change this world? So as we uh, play in this last song, uh, the communion tables will be open.